when Christ comes again, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's read about it here. Revelation 21, starting at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their position will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. That's where we'll stop for now. But keep your Bibles open. We're going to look back in a, at a couple other verses here too. When Christ comes again, the souls who have gone before will reunite with our bodies and uh, the dead will rise and there will be what we have, what we call the the resurrection of the body and we will inherit a new heaven and a new earth. There's a lot of disagreements between Christians about what happens and how all of this works up until this point, but at this point, we all agree There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and we are going to be with the Lord forever. So when the final judgment is complete, there will be a new heaven and earth. The final destiny for believers is not on clouds as just disembodied souls in heaven. Our final destiny, when all is said and done, is going to be here on earth in a new heaven and a new earth that has been remade for us. And... There's, a, there's not a lot of detail that the Bible gives us about this. We, it's going to be wonderful. We're, it's going to be beyond what we can imagine. But there are some images that the Bible gives for us to try to give us an idea about what it will be like. So there's eight different images I want to kind of mention to you today that give us an idea about what this new heaven and new earth is going to be like. The first one is city. There's going to be, it's going to be like a city. If you saw verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, a, a city here. Now I know that uh, we're, we're in the country here, and, and so when, when you think of cities, that may not sound very uh, appealing to maybe many of you. But, uh, but it's not going to be like the cities that we have in our minds at all. When we think of cities, sometimes we think of crime or slums or garbage, sleaze and lots of traffic, that this city is not going to be like that. This city is going to be the city of God. 
And there's going to be people, culture, diversity, community, togetherness. And there's, it talks about a city in other places too, like Hebrews 11. It says, as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. A city. In uh, the Last Supper, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. This new earth will be like the ideal city. It's going to be an ideal city. Everyone will live together and work together as pieces of a puzzle make a complete picture it will be togetherness and cooperation and it will be and one we will be one together like that in verse 26 it talks about they will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations and uh, there will be this great diversity where all the peoples of the world are going to bring the most wonderful things that they have to offer. And it's going to be this wonderful place where everybody's strengths are going to complement and benefit and bless one another. It's this wonderful picture because we all have different strengths and weaknesses. And when we come together and we can use our strengths to build each other up, and that's what it's going to be like. So every culture in the world is going to bring its best into this city to honor God and edify all the rest of us. There's a joke that I, that I really like that uh, kind of describes this a little bit. If you, uh, you kind of know a little bit about the reputations of some different countries, you'll, you'll kind of get where this is going. So it goes like this. Heaven is where the police are British, the chefs Italian, the mechanics German, the lovers French, and it's all organized by the Swiss. That's heaven. <clears throat> Hell is where the police are German, the chefs British, the mechanics French, the lovers Swiss, and it's all organized by the Italians. <laughs> I like that joke. <laughs> but the best of all the nations are going to be there and we are going to be able to bless one another and it's going to be heaven there. The best of the whole world is going to come together in all of its great diversity that God has made, and we are going to be one people. So city is one image. That number two, garden. Garden. If, if city doesn't really draw you too much, then garden probably will. Garden is more hinted at at the very next chapter of Revelation chapter 22. It starts there, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's a lot more that we could unpack there. The leaves of the tree of life are for healing of the nations and when you take from this tree of life it doesn't just sustain you for a moment or a day it sustains you forever the tree of life so food is going to be so much different there it's going to give us life that is real life not just sustain us for a few hours it's going to be something unimaginable you notice that it said there the the river of life and the tree of life, and that's meant to remind us of the Garden of Eden. So the last chapter of the Bible is going back to the first chapter of the Bible, when God made everything good, and it was wonderful and blessed, and everything was running the way it was supposed to. And there was was no sin, there were no problems, there was no death. So it's like God is restoring the Garden of Eden like it was originally intended. Garden. Now, there's, there's some passages that say that the earth is going to burn, and I don't want to just forget about that. So, for example, in 2 Peter 3, it talks about how 
The heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And it goes on a little bit more too, but I want to just say something about that. God isn't going to burn the world to annihilate it. He's going to burn it to cleanse it. It's going to be a purifying fire, a refiner's fire. It's going to burn off all of the sin and evil in this creation so that what's left is going to be the wonderful good creation that God originally created. So God isn't going to destroy the creation, but cleanse it. And so there's verses that talk about how the creation is waiting for this. It's longing for this. So Romans 8, 19-21, I think that's on the screen there. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So even the creation is going to be restored. And there's going to be this wonderful garden, like the Garden of Eden, like God originally intended it. It's going to be wonderful. So this new earth is going to be like the Garden of Eden. We're going to have an idea about the way it was at the very beginning, before sin entered this world and corrupted all things and made a mess of everything. We're going to have that idea about what it's like to take from that tree of life and to drink from that river of life. And we're going to have life from that that is not going to just sustain us for a moment. It's going to sustain us forever. Food and water is going to be a whole new world there. It's going to be wonderful. A third image is banquet. A wonderful Massive banquet. Jesus said when He healed uh, the centurion's servant, I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. It's, we're going to recline at the table as a, at a feast. Or at the Last Supper, Jesus passed. He didn't drink it at the end there. He said, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he is going to, I can just see him leading that toast, kind of like we have toast set at weddings. When we have that final banquet, Jesus is going to give that, that toast there and he's going to drink that cup with us anew in that kingdom. In Revelation 19.9, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we have like small tastes of this here. We, we have wedding receptions that are nice and wonderful and they're elaborate. We go all out for them. And we have Thanksgivings and, and Christmases where there's wonderful food and there's wonderful fellowship and we have a wonderful time together. So we have just tiny glimmers of of what this will be like. But there's going to be a heavenly banquet. And it's going to be it's going to be just so much more than anything we've ever had here. The new earth will be like a great holiday feast. Just this massive, wonderful feast to celebrate the consummation of all things. When there's this new heaven and new earth. That is going to be something to celebrate. People danced in the streets when World War II was over. Imagine what it's going to be like when sin is over. There's going to be dancing in the streets. There's going to be parades. There's going to be festivities. And we are going to feast and celebrate. It's going to be a wonderful banquet. I'm looking forward to that. Great food, great company, great music, wonderful decor, an atmosphere of delight. Banquet is an image that we have. Isaiah 25 said this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. It's this feast that's coming that God is going to prepare for us. 
If you think there's some good cooks out there right now, if you think your mom is a good cook or your grandma's a good cook, just wait till God prepares a feast for you. That food's going to taste so much better. So a banquet. Number four, <clears throat> jewels. It gives us an image of jewels as in jewelry. Verse 11 that we just read, it said that the city had the glory of God. Its radiance was a most rare jewel like a jasper, clear as crystal. And in verse 2, it talked about how it was a bride adorned for her husband. And a little beyond where we, where we just read, it lists a bunch of different, a bunch of different jewels and, and precious stones. Some of them I'm not going to try to pronounce. But it talks about them, and there's, there's 12 of them. And it lists each one. It counts them as it lists them. So jewels, when we think of jewels... Perhaps maybe the thing that we might think of first is, is their beauty. Their beauty and, and their value. They're beautiful and they're valuable. So the new earth will be a place of great beauty and of great value. No expense is going to be spared on this new place. When we have a wedding feast, we... Don't ex- we don't spare any expense. We go all out for this because it's a wonderful thing that's happening. And God, in this new day, He's not going to spare any expense. He's going to go all elaborate because it's going to be a wonderful celebration. Ezekiel mentions these same 12 stones in Eden, by the way. And the text counts them as 12 Twelve is a symbol in the Bible. Twelve is a symbol of completeness. And it goes back almost always to the twelve tribes of Israel. The priestly breastplate that the priests wore in the Old Testament had twelve jewels. Jewels that were all inscribed with the twelve tribes of Israel. So it's kind of meant to make us think of that. So 12 represents completeness, and in the Bible, specifically, completeness of God's people. So, what we kind of get an image of here is that God sees wonderful beauty and value in all of His people together. When we look at one another, we see differences, we see Winners, losers, we see beautiful and unattractive. We see rich and poor. But when God sees His people, He doesn't do those comparison games like we do. He sees beauty and value in all of us together. God sees us much differently than we do. And on that great day, all of that is going to come together in a wonderful, beautiful picture. So jewels. Number five, marriage. In verse two, it said, a bride prepared for her husband. Verse nine, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And in Revelation 19, it says, the voice of a great multitude, the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now maybe, maybe marriage isn't a good image for you right now. I mean, there's a lot of marriages that end poorly. There's maybe half of them that end in divorce. And even the marriages that do stay together, many of them are not happy. Many of them are are distant and full of trouble, problems, conflict, strife. But the new earth is going to be a different kind of marriage. It's going to be a perfect marriage to a perfect Savior. And we as God's people, 
all together are like his bride. And it's going to be a marriage that has pure, perfect love in it. Love that is not tainted by sin or strife or problems or distance or animosity or anything like that. His love is perfect. So if you think about the people that you love right now, whether that's parents, children, or husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, if you value that kind of love, if that is wonderful to you, that love is still just a shadow of God's love. And whatever you value in the relationships that you have right now is only just a glimmer of what God's love is like. And so that's why even our most valued people here are still second to God. As wonderful as our family and friends are here, to God they are still second because His love is the definition of all love. So bear that in mind. Whenever you value the love and the people that you have here, it's just a shadow of God's love. And this love is meant to point you to that love and to make you long for it even all the more. So marriage, the new earth will be a perfect marriage to a perfect Savior because His love is perfect. And we will know perfect love. So marriage is an image. Number six is maybe a little different, but walls. Walls. In verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates. A great high wall. Not a little wall, a big wall. Okay? We usually, when you think of walls, we think of separation, you know? We put up walls to keep ourselves from one another. But when we're looking at the walls in this new heaven and earth, I think what we're supposed to think of is not that kind of thing. We're supposed to see walls as protection and safety. So this new earth is going to have an ultimate protection and safety where evil is shut out forever. Nothing is going to harm us. Nothing is going to hurt us. Nothing is going to come after us. Nothing is going to oppress us. It's going to be shut out by those big, massive walls. It's going to be out there. We're going to be safe in here. Safety, protection, Evil is shut out forever. In verse 27 of the chapter we read, it says, Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So nothing is going to enter it that is going to corrupt the wonderful existence that we have there. will be protected. Number seven reign, as in rule. In chapter 22, verse 5, it says this, Night will be no more. There will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. They will reign. And there's a lot of other verses that talk about this too. Romans 8, 16, 17 The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we have, we are heirs to the same kingdom that Christ is. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with Him. Revelation 2.26, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Reign, rule. I got like five or six more here too. To reign. If you look back 
in Genesis, we were originally created to reign, to have dominion over this creation that God made. This is how we were designed. God put us together so that we would be able to rule and to want to and to enjoy that and to find purpose in that. So, Genesis 1.28, God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we are created to have dominion. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing when it's done right. So right now, we have kind of like little kingdoms, right? We have our possessions and, and we can order them and use them as we please. We have houses or apartments that we can decorate as, as we like because they're ours, they're our dominion. We have cars where we can drive where we like. We have perhaps pets that we can raise how we like and take care of. And we have perhaps land that we can use and enjoy as we like to we, because it's ours. So we have our little kingdoms now. But then, when all is said and done, we're going to reign in all its fullness. We're going to have possessions without moth and rust destroying or thieves breaking in and stealing. We're going to have work without toil or stress. We'll have learning without pressure and grades. And we'll have art without obscenity. And we'll be able to create and rule this world like God wants us originally intended. We're going to have dominion. So the new earth will be like having the ideal job. And that might look a little different for each one of us because God made us differently with different gifts and interests and such. And God did that on purpose because we were made to, to work together, to have like a society where we all build each other up and help one another but we will have, it'll be like having the best job where you go to work every day and you are excited to do this work because you were made to do this. This is what you were made to do. And you find meaning and fulfillment in it. And, this, and you get to see how you're blessing other people and benefiting them and how God is using you to help one another. And we will take ownership of this world under God's direct supervision and there will be new inventions, new discoveries, and new buildings. And who knows, maybe touring distant galaxies will have eternity. It will be all kinds of things to discover and explore there. It's not going to get boring. It's not going to get boring at all. The sky's the limit. Number eight. God. God. I love how it says, it words it in verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Just, it says the same thing there a couple different times, reinforcing that God is going to be with them. And they are going to be His people. He is going to be their God. In verse 16, the new Jerusalem city is sized up. It's sized up as a cube, a perfect cube in multiples of 12. There's 12 again. And that's maybe meant to remind us of the most holy place in the Old Testament where only the high priest could enter and only once a year and not without blood. And then after Christ died, that curtain of that most holy place was torn in two so that anybody could enter it. And so all of us have access to the most holy place. But there, the most holy place is going to enlarge so that it's going to be the whole. We're all going to be in this most holy place together. God's direct presence, fullness of His presence is going to be there God is with us now, but we are going to have the fullness of His presence in all of His glory there. The complete presence of God Himself is going to be in this new earth. 
when he appears, we are going to see him because we will see him as he is. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you, Psalm 73. Nothing on earth compares with having God, and especially in all of his fullness. I love verse 4. It's probably my favorite verse in the Bible. You will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That Greek word for wipe away has connotations of cancel, remove. He's going to remove that sadness from us. He's going to remove it. It's going to be gone. He will wipe away sadness. All our mourning will turn to dancing. Kind of like the mourning of the cross on Good Friday turned into dancing and shouting on Easter. That's going to, we're going to have that with all of our sorrows and all of our problems. Good Friday is going to turn into Easter for every one of us. He's going to wipe away all those tears. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, Psalm 30 says. Mourning will turn to dancing. Whatever problems or sufferings we go through now is going to be no comparison with what is to come. God makes all of our problems and suffering worthwhile. Romans 8.18 I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. It's no comparison. It's going to be so worth our while. Our mourning is going to turn to dancing. Let's uh, look at the screen here and let's answer this question together. How does the article in the Apostles' Creed concerning life everlasting comfort you? Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, So after this life, I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined, a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. We have a life everlasting to look forward to. And unbelievable as it all sounds, it's beyond our imagination, maybe it even sounds unbelievable, but I love what it says in verse 6. As unbelievable as it sounds, Jesus says, it is done. It's done. It's, it's done already. It's going to happen. It's as sure as this moment and yesterday. And it's all freely given by God's wonderful grace. And this is what we have to look forward to as believers. So, just one, one admonishment for you. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, not on earthly things. Because this is the riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints that God has prepared for all of those who believe. Amen. Let us bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, It's unbelievable what you have for us, but we believe it because you have said it is done. And we can't imagine it, but it's going to be wonderful. We look forward to that day. Help us not to get distracted by the things of this world and the the evil that entices us. But Lord, to, to look with longing for you and all that you are offering us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.